Welcome back to episode 50 of our journey through music history, and we're going to continue on from last week with our second part of Romantic Opera. Here, we're going to look at the enchanting world of Richard Wagner's groundbreaking music dramas. Wagner's magnum opus, Der Ring des Nebelungen, or The Nibelungen's Ring, is a monumental four-part four saga that unfolds over four separate nights of epic storytelling. This romantic masterpiece spans hours of captivating music, immersing us in a world of gods, goddesses, giants, dwarfs, and mythical creatures drawn from Germanic and Norse legend. At the heart of the ring lies a tale of moral decline. Fueled by greed for power and wealth, Wagner ingeniously weaves together a complex web of characters and emotions, utilizing the orchestra to convey their deepest thoughts and feelings. Through the use of light motifs, recurring musical motives associated with specific characters and ideas, Wagner creates a rich, rich psychological tapestry that evolves and transforms with the unfolding drama. In this mesmerizing journey, we encounter Sigmund and Siglinda, two of Wotan's children, tragically separated in their early years. Their forbidden and passionate love sets the stage for a story of immense depth and emotional intensity. As the orchestra paints vivid musical landscapes, we witness their fateful encounter, their shared moments of tenderness, and the ultimate challenges they face. Wagner's music dramas defy conventional operatic conventions as the singers deliver their lines through declamatory recitative-like passages eschewing traditional arias. The orchestra takes center stage, giving voice to the characters' innermost thoughts and adding layers of psychological depth. Wagner's use of ever-evolving leitmotif allows us to experience the shifting emotions and complexities of the characters. As we delve into the world of Wagner's ring, we are transported to a realm where love, power, and destiny intertwine. Prepare to be captivated by the soaring melodies, the dramatic orchestral textures, and the profound exploration of human emotions. Der Ring des Nibelungen stands as one of the towering achievements in the realm of art, a timeless masterpiece comparable to the Taj Mahal, the Iliad, and the Odyssey, and Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel. So sit back, embrace the grandeur, and immerse yourself in the timeless beauty and dramatic power of Wagner's monumental music dramas. Before we get into any more depth about Wagner, I do want to issue a bit of a disclaimer. Despite his artistic genius, there are a lot of negative aspects about Wagner. Wagner was deeply anti-Semitic, and some of the most unlikable characters in the ring cycle and these are characters that we're not going to meet, are meant to be caricatures of how he viewed Jewish people. A lot of his music later on was utilized by the Nazi party in Germany, and Wagner would have been sympathetic to the beliefs of the Nazi party. So I think it's important to mention these kind of horrific things about him before I just get into singing his praises. That we really need to be able to separate who Wagner was as a man and who Wagner was as an artist. Because his art is amazing, but a lot of his thoughts on humanity are kind of disgusting. So I just wanted to start us off with a little note about that. So Wagner was a highly influential composer of the 19th century, following in the footsteps of Beethoven. He made significant contributions to both instrumental music and opera, revolutionizing the way that they were composed. One of his notable achievements 
was his concept of the total work of art, which he called Gesamtkunstwerk, where he aimed to unify various artistic elements in the operas. He also introduced a unique operatic technique called the guiding motive, or leitmotiv. These were maybe thoughts in other people's minds, but Wagner really brought these concepts to life. Unlike his predecessors, Wagner not only composed music, but also developed intricate theories about art, music, and opera. In fact, he even ventured into political and philosophical realms, though with unfortunate outcomes. Wagner's intense self-awareness as an artist foreshadowed later attitudes towards art. His opera theory had both positive and negative aspects. Firstly, he sought to break away from the conventions of earlier operas, particularly those of French and Italian origins. He believed that opera had strayed from its original purpose as a serious musical drama akin to ancient Greek theater, which involved singing or chanting. Wagner criticized the practice of turning opera into a mere costume concert. He especially disapproved of arias, which formed the core of Italian opera, considering them artificial and interruptive. He questioned the need for the dramatic action to pause repeatedly for beautiful but undramatic singing. So a little bit about Wagner. Wagner was born in Leipzig during the time of war, with the Napoleonic Wars causing turmoil in the region. Sadly, his father passed away shortly after his birth. Wagner's stepfather, an intriguing actor and writer, influenced the young boy and sparked his intellectual curiosity. Wagner's interests revolved around literature and music, with his idols being Shakespeare and Beethoven. As he grew older, his interests expanded to include philosophy, mythology, and religion. During his youth, he worked as an opera conductor and spent a challenging year in Paris, attempting to have one of his works performed at a prestigious opera house. The negative experiences he encountered in Paris led to his strong anti-French sentiments expressed in some of his later writings. Upon returning to Germany, he created his first notable operas, The Flying Dutchman, Tannhäuser, and Lohengrin. While these works largely followed the early romantic opera style of Carl Maria von Weber, they hinted at Wagner's revolutionary ideas for opera. Wagner's revolutionary ideas were finally formulated after he was exiled from Germany due to his involvement in the revolution from 1848 to 1849. During his exile, he wrote numerous articles and books expounding his ideas. One of his influential works, Opera and Drama, led to the principles of his concept of music drama. The first installment of this momental, mo monumental four-evening opera, the Nibelungsring, called The Rheingold, was completed in 1854, but was not produced for 15 years until 1869. It's important to note, as I said before, that Wagner's anti-Semitic writings, along with his operas, were later embraced by the Nazis 50 years after his death. Wagner's exile lasted for 13 years until his fortune took a dramatic turn when he gained the support of Cl King Ludwig II of Bavaria, who was young, unstable, and eventually became mentally ill. With Ludwig's backing, Wagner's mature music dramas were finally produced, and he advocated for the construction of a dedicated opera house in Bayreuth, Germany, exclusively for his dramas. This concept was groundbreaking. His grand and slow-moving works were based on myths, featured his own lofty poetry, a powerful orchestral style, and employed leitmotifs, or guiding motives. Even today, the Opera House in Bayreuth exclusively performs Wagner's works, and obtaining tickets to the annual Wagner Festival is extremely challenging. He possessed a charismatic personality and was able to secure financial support for many individuals while earning the loyalty and affection of distinguished men and women. His first marriage to a singer ended in divorce. His famous operatic work, Tristan and Isolde, was partly inspired by his love affair with the wife of one of his patrons. His second wife, Cosima, the daughter of Franz Liszt, 
had previously been married to an important conductor named Hans von Bülow, who nonetheless remained one of Wagner's strongest supporters. Cosima's diaries provide insight into Wagner's moods, dreams, thoughts, and musical decisions as he openly shared them with her. Following the death of Wagner, Cosima wielded significant influence over Bayreuth. Richard Wagner was a complex figure, part con man and part visionary, a mediocre poet but a talented musician. He sparked heated controversy throughout his lifetime and his influence remains significant to this day. Wagner was a major figner, figure in the intellectual landscape of the time, shaping not only the world of music, but also other art forms. In this regard, Wagner stands as the most important composer of the Romantic era. So that brings us to this idea of Gesamtkunstwerk. So Wagner's program had a positive aspect that emerged in the 1950s leading to the development of a new type of opera that he called music drama. In these works, music shared the spotlight with poetry, drama, and philosophy, all of which were provided by Wagner himself. He used the term Gesamtkunstwerk, meaning total work of art, to describe this powerful concept. Wagner always emphasized the distinction between music drama and ordinary opera. In the Gesamtkunstwerk, words and ideas played a crucial role, closely intertwined with the music. The music itself was intensely emotional, following the principles of Romanticism. The dramas explored profound philosophical ideas, and least according, at least according to Wagner and his supporters. They were presented through the lens of medieval German myths and legends, which served as a symbolic representation. This use of myth was a characteristic of the Romantic era and foreshadowed the ideas of Freud, who viewed myth as vehicle for expressing deep unconscious truths, such as the myth of Oedipus. Wagner employed various mythological sources, including the romantic tale of Tristan and Isult, the saga of the Norse god Wotan, and the Arthurian legend of Sir Percival. Through these narratives, he conveyed his perspectives on love, political power, and religion. Wagner's glorification of Germanic myths, in particular, positioned him as a semi-official voice of German nationalism, which unfortunately played a role in the rise of Hitler. Wagner, known as one of the most... Sorry, known as the first great conductor and a skilled orchestrator, elevated the role of the orchestra in his opera. He drew inspiration from Beethoven's symphonies, and emphasizing motivic development and granting the orchestra a more prominent role. Light motifs, which I'll talk about in just a second, which are recurring musical themes associated with specific characters, ideas, or emotions, were among the musical devices he used to achieve his symphonic continuity. The orchestra was no longer merely a support for singers, as was the case in traditional opera. Instead, it took on the responsibility of propelling the opera forward. In contrast to the traditional structure of alternating recitatives and arias and ensembles, music drama featured a continuous orchestral fabric int intricately interwoven with the singing. So, I mentioned this term, leitmotif. Um, it is a musical motive that represents, as I've said, a person, thing, idea, or symbol in a drama. In Wagner's works, the orchestra uses light motifs to guide the listener through the story. By presenting and developing these musical motifs, the orchestra helps convey the emotions and thoughts associated with specific characters or concepts. This is something that a lot of composers, especially uh, cinematic composers, do. If you listen to John Williams, whether it be Harry Potter or Star Wars, it is full of light motifs. In fact, We've been talking about that in school year 23, 24 uh, as a theme that comes up to understand the movies better through the music. Light motifs can sometimes be seen as humorous when using in a mechanical manner. For example, if the orchestra plays a sword motive every time the hero reaches for his weapon, it can seem exaggerated or comical. 
However, leitmotifs can also convey subtle and complex emotions. They can suggest what the hero is thinking or feeling, even when their words or actions may indicate otherwise. Wagner became skilled at transforming these motifs, using a variation-like technique common among romantic composers. Through this transformation, he could show how a person or idea evolves and changes in response to the dramatic events unfolding in the story. For romantics, music was considered the universal language of emotion. Light motifs, being musical expressions, could con convey ideas on an emotional level beyond the words alone that could be achieved intellectually. This was Wagner's theory, which aligned with the romantic belief in the power of music. Furthermore, the intricate network of leitmotifs provided Wagner's lengthy music dramas with thematic unity, a quality highly sought after at, by other romantic composers. Both psych psychologically and technically, leitmotifs had a significant impact on the audiences of the 19th century. Wagner's first completed music drama was the captivating story of Tristan and Isolde, which originated from medieval legend. The legend already had a mystical element, and as Wagner wrote the opera's libretto, he further developed it under the influence of romantic thinking. Wagner found support for his ideas in the writings of a philosopher named Arthur Schopenhauer, who shared the romantic belief in the profound role of music in our emotional lives. According to Schopenhauer, all human experiences can be categorized into emotions and desires, which he referred to as the will, and ideas, morals, and reasons, which he regarded as less significant. He emphasized that the will always dominates our perception and that music provides us with a direct and unfiltered experience of it. Almost as if in agreement with Schopenhauer, Wagner might have exclaimed, through my music, in a music drama, what better way to illustrate the power of the will than through the strongest human drive of all, sexual love? Tristan and Isolde is more than just a love story. It explores something deeper. It presents love as the dominant force in life, surpassing all worldly concerns. While many love stories hint at such transcendence, Wagner's story explicitly embodies the idea based on his own philosophical beliefs. The plot unfolds step by step, demonstrating the growing strength of love. The music, with its enchanting orchestral web of light motifs and rich romantic harmonies, becomes increasingly powerful as well. In Act One, love conquers Isolde's pride, which had previously led her to despise Tristan as her blood enemy, and it also overcomes Tristan's sense of duty as he escorts Isolde safely to her marriage with King Mark, his uncle and liege lord. In Act 2, love defies their existing marriages as the pair engage in the longest unconsummated love scene in all of opera. Their secret encounter is discovered and Tristan is mortally wounded, but even then, love prevails. In Act 3, Tristan clings to life until Isolde arrives from afar. He eventually dies in her arms and she, overwhelmed with joy, joins him in death. For both of them, Death is not a defeat, but a euphoric expression of their life, love. At this point, the plot transcends the boundaries of reality, a deliberate choice by Wagner. Tristan and Isolde, no longer just characters, symbolize the universal will, operating in a realm where social rules, conventions, and even life and death lose their significance. Transcendence is a recurring theme in Romanticism and in this opera, Passion becomes the ultimate experience, surpassing reality itself. Music, which exists beyond reality, explores the ambiguous space between love and sensuality and death. Here in this picture, it's act two of the opera, where Isolde signals Tristan that all is clear for their fatal meeting. Wagner's monumental work, the Nibelung's Ring, also known as the Ring Cycle, is a massive music drama consisting of four parts, each spanning an evening of three to five hours. This ambitious creation, developed over a period of 25 years, stands as the ultimate example of the romantic inclination towards grandiosity. Often referred to simply as the Ring, 
The composition grew in size due to Wagner's desire to encompass vast portions of the renowned Germanic and Norse legends. It encompasses a multitude of characters, including gods, goddesses, giants, dwarves, mythical prophecies, transformative powers, a dragon, and an invisibility cloak that resonates with modern literature like Harry Potter. Amidst the elaborate tapestry, deeply human emotions and actions unfold. The Ring ranks among the most significant artistic achievements of all time, on par with architectural marvels like the Taj Mahal, epic poems like the Iliad and the Odyssey, and masterpieces like Michelangelo's Sistine Chap Chapel, comparisons that Wagner, with his grandiose aspirations, would have relished. The first part of this cycle, Das Rheingold, or the Rheingold, sets the stage for events that will unfold in the subsequent three nights. It depicts the theft of a precious piece of gold from the Rhine River, which rightfully belongs to the river's mermaids, by a dwarf named Albrecht. The gods then seize the stolen gold from Albrecht. The gold is subsequently forged into the ring mentioned in the title by the dwarves under Albrecht's command. The ring carries a curse that compels anyone who possesses it, including Wotan, the leader of the gods, to forsake the lo love that could free them from its corrupt influence. In this context, love encompasses a broad range of human compassion. Over the next three nights of the ring, Die Valkyr, or the Valkyrie, Siegfried, and Gotadamerung, the twilight of the gods, ge generations pass, witnessing the downfall of gods, humans, dwarves, and even a transformed giant dragon due to their insatiable lust for the gold. A pure-hearted hero named Siegfried emerges, capable of defying the gods and their corrupt system, but even he falls victim to treachery, resulting from everyone else's relentless pursuit of the ring. Does this sound like another story that you might be aware of? Perhaps Lord of the Rings? So a lot of similarities there are between this and Lord of the Rings, and this came first. Wagner employs this elaborate mythological framework to convey a straightforward modern tale. At its core, the work explores the moral decay of the world brought about by greed for wealth and hunger over power. Disguised as Norse gods, gnomes, and warriors, successive groups of 19th century society are depicted destroying themselves in the relentless pursuit of gold. Even the renunciation of love that accompanies possessing the ring serves as an allegory, transforming the ancient myth into a critique of modern bourgeois values, which prioritize work and discipline while su suppressing emotions. In the Valkyrie, which is the second night of the ring cycle, a significant portion of the opera fo focuses on a subplot within Wagner's narrative. The subplot brings together Sigmund and Sieglinda, two of Wotan's many children who were separated in early childhood. The opera explores their irresistible attraction to each other, resulting in an incestuous union, which is doubly forbidden since Siglinda is already married to Hunding. In Act 2, Hunding um, engages in a duel with Sigmund. Wotan, due to his entanglement with the Cursed Ring, is unable to intervene and aid his son, resulting in Sigmund's death and enactment of the Curse of the Gold. However, Siglinda manages to escape and carries their child, the hero Siegfried, who becomes the protagonist in the next two nights of the ring. The first scene of Act 1 portrays the meeting of Sigmund and Siglinda. Sigmund enters her dwelling, exhausted and pursued by enemies in the midst of a raging thunderstorm. The storm is, predicted by the or or is depicted by the orchestral prelude that opens the opera, creating a parallel to our own prelude. Sigmund collapses by the hearth to the sound of a light motif that becomes closely associated with him, a descending scale that is transformed version of the th storm theme. This musical connection reveals that the storm exists within Sigmund's soul, and much of it does in the ex as much as it does in the external world. Siglinda enters from a back room and is surprised to find an unfamiliar man unconscious on her floor. As she leans over him, showing concern, the, violin, the violins play her leitmotif, gently rising and falling 
while the cellos continue to play Sigmund's motif. Wagner's orchestral music has already merged the two characters. What follows is one of the most remarkable portrayals of love at first sight in all of opera. Or perhaps love that develops rapidly upon their initial encounter. Sigmund and Siglinda's attention is immediately captivated by each other, and the intensity of their emotional connections deepens rapidly during the scene. In Wagner's revolutionary music drama, several key features are prominently displayed. First is the orchestra as a psychological portrayer. The orchestra carrying light motifs plays a crucial role beyond merely accompaniment. It conveys the characters' thoughts and, more importantly, their emotions, even during extended periods when they are not singing. Though the orchestra music, a profound sense of psychological depth and complexity is achieved, employing music to communicate emotions more effectively than words alone, as is characteristic uh, of the romantic tradition. Second are transformative leitmotifs. The leitmotifs rarely remain static and unchanging. Instead, they undergo subtle transformations each time they reappear, adapting and evolving in response to the unfolding drama. This dramatic portrayal of the characters' emotions adds depth and nuance to their psych psychological journeys, making it a defining characteristic of Wagnerian drama. Three has to do with the singer's delivery. In contrast to the tuneful melodies and lyrical songs found in Verdi's operas like Rigoletto, Wagner's singers do not typically sing light motifs. Instead, they employ a style of vocal de delivery known as declamation, resembling recitative. While occasionally approaching melodic beauty, it never fully develops into a fully structured aria. This approach allows for a more flexible and expressive delivery of the text, focusing on dramatic expression of the words rather than formalized melodic structure. These features collectively contribute to the unique and revolutionary nature of Wagner's music dramas, creating a deeply psychological and emotionally immersive experience for the audience. As Siglinda fulfills Sigmund's request for a drink, the focus shifts to the orchestra. It takes over building up the musical tension to a small climax before receding. During this orchestral interlude, the leitmotif associated with Sigmund and Siglinda can still be heard. Weaving together their musical themes, Sigmund drinks from the horn, and as he looks at Siglinda for the first time, a new melody emerges in the orchestra. This melody is warmingly scored, featuring a solo cello accompanied by other low strings and rich harmonies. It represents the leitmotif of their blossoming love, symbolizing the deepening emotion connection between Sigmund and Siglinda. Following this musical interlude, the characters engage in an exchange of information. They share details about their respective situations, providing insight for both themselves and the audience. Siglinda reveals that she is married to Hunding, while Sigmund recounts how he arrived at her home and expresses the relief and newfound happiness she has brought into his life, remarking, Now the sun smiles on me anew. This scene showcases the power of music to convey the emotional and narrative elements of the story, highlighting the growing bond between Sigmund and Siglinda and setting the stage for their unfolding love. As Siglinda rushes to her storeroom to fetch honeyed mead for S Sigmund, the parallel action to her earlier task of fetching water triggers an intensified version of the orchestral climax. The music swells with increased intensity, reflecting the heightened emotional moment. The lovers share the mead, their gaze fixed on each other, and the love motive uh, resurfaces in the orchestra, growing in prominence. However, the scene takes a turn as Sigmund interrupts the moment with a deep sigh, accompanied by a loud, dissonant chord in the orchestra. This signifies his relation, realization of his ill-fated destiny, a misfortune f f that follows him everywhere he goes. Wagner emphasizes this by setting the word misvenda, or misfortune, to additional dissonant chords. Sigmund expresses his concern, stating that he would not want to bring such misery upon Siglinda, represented by the recurring love motif in the music. 
He feels compelled to leave. However, Siglinda cannot bear the thought of letting him go. Overwhelmed by her emotions, she stops him in his tracks and impulsively confesses that she is ill-fated, uh, that she is as ill-fated as he is. This pivotal moment reveals the depth of their connection and the shared sense of destiny that they feel. The music captures the emotional turmoil intensity of their bond as they face the realization of their intertwined fates. As Siglinda utters her final word, a hesitant yet warm melody emerges from the low registers of the orchestra. Its presence immediately conveys the deep empathy and connection that Sigmund and Siglinda share. Wagner employs a technique he favored, known as sequencing, where the melody is played in a repeated pattern, further developing the leitmotif. When Sigmund declares that he will stay with Siglinda, the orchestra cannot contain its excitement. It bursts forth with a lush and romantic harmonization of the new melody as the soon-to-be lovers gaze at each other in the midst of this beautiful passage. Other leitmotifs are intertwined with the music, including Sigmund's motif, the love motif, and Sigmund's drooping scale, enriching the emotional tapestry of the scene. However, this enchanting passage is abruptly interrupted as a new ominous leitmotif emerges from the low brass section of the orchestra. It signifies the return of Hunding, signaling the beginning of the second scene. Wagner skillfully employs these musical techniques to heighten the dramatic tension and create a sense of anticipation, as the lover's tender moment is abruptly halted by the impeding conflict with Hunding. I know that today's a bit of a longer lesson uh, because once we got into talking about the ring, it takes time and we don't want to separate things. So to end off our lesson here today, let's have a listen to Wagner's Die Valkyrie, The Valkyrie, Act 1, Scene 1.
mir der Quell. Des müden Last macht er leicht. Erfrischt ist der Mut, das auch erfreut es sehens. Seelige Lust. Hier ist's, hier so mir es lacht.
And that concludes our lesson for this week. Uh, I apologize again for the length of this episode, but the listening example itself was just around 12 minutes. So there was a lot to include here. Next week, as we wrap up romantic opera, it will be much shorter. We're going to take a look at Puccini and his opera, Madame Butterfly, and that will be how we end up romantic opera. It'll be a short one, I promise. So, until next week, cheers. <laughs>